Our second panel today is a very distinguished group of individuals. Dave Liebertru is the International Paper Vice President of Global Sourcing, and we welcome him. Uh, Linda Walker is uh, Director of uh, WWF Global Trust, uh, Global Forest and uh, Trade Area. Of course, we all know Bill Mellon from the Nature Conservancy and the work he's done with us through the years. And of course, Donna Harmon is here uh, with the Mar American Forest and Paper Association, and she was at breakfast this morning and uh, has spent a, a, a great part of the day with us today. So we thank her and thank all of you, and I'll now turn it back to our moderator, Dr. Kosh Ahar. Thank you, sir, and we'll get going. I, it was a great morning panel where you heard from the people's representative. Now we've got the great honor to have two of the leading forest association and industry folks here and two of the leading conservation groups, WWF and TNC. So we'll go, I think, industry conservation, industry conservation, the way we are laid out here. Now the early sort of planning of these uh, panels were talk a little bit more about the wood processing and manufacturing in the morning, the first panel, and then talk about sort of forestry practices in the second. Uh, because, but as we got mixed up, I think it's, it's fair game now to talk about both those things as you, as you see in both of the panels. So I think now we're looking at a congressional members panel talking about processing in forestry, and now an industry conservation panel talking about uh, processing and, and forestry. So with that, I will turn over to the first speaker. I would request um, five minutes of opening statements. I've got a note here that says two minutes. I'll pass that on when there's two left, and then we'll uh, go through a Q&A and then a closing statement at the end of it. So great honor to have um, Mr. Dave Leitreau from uh, Vice President Global Sourcing International Papers. Yours, sir. Thank you. I thought that was new guidance, so I was aiming for two. <laughs> I've been uh, in my role as Vice President of Global Sourcing for International Paper. I'm responsible for everything that we, uh, we purchase worldwide, and for about the last 10 years have been responsible for our, our fiber purchasing, which is our, our biggest purchase. And, you know, that's a lot of where our sustainability efforts have been focused over the years, and we're now starting to gravitate uh, and really focus on all elements of our, of our purchasing and supply chain. But uh, I'm happy to be here to, today to represent the international paper team. Uh, and I'm proud of the, the history of our company, uh, which is, uh, we just have a proud history of stewardship and conservation, uh, which we've done very well over our 116-year our history. Uh, we today are the largest consumer of wood in the world, over 70 million tons, in fact about 71 million tons um, in the 70s are important. Also, about 70% of the energy that we consume on a, on a daily basis comes from biomass. So, so it comes from the tree, we use every element of the trees that we harvest. Uh, and that's something that, uh, that we're very proud of. So 72, 73% of our energy comes from biomass, and I was reflecting on that this morning, and in fact, you know, we've all talked about and, and heard about uh, the, shale the shale gas uh, proliferation and that rich resource that we've rediscovered in this country. Um, but what we use in biomass um, on an annual basis here in North America is about equivalent to one complete day of gas production in North America. So had we not done that, we would consume another whole day's production uh, of gas. So it's a very important part of our sustainability platform. But just as we've sort of rediscovered these energy uh, reserves, um, we've long been sitting on some of the great forests in the world. In fact, I, I consider the, the southern forest one of the great pine forests uh, in the world. And, uh, and it's from that base that uh, we're now really a, a net exporter, creating jobs and then pushing our products out into different parts of the world. And some 23% of our products uh, were exported in, in 2013. We are a company who has gone to other parts of the world, 
taken our sustainability practices, taken our best practices, uh, and as we go around the world, uh, we're not going out there to, to create product and ship it back, but to take our practices out there um, and sustainability being a very important part of that. And less than uh, a tenth of a percent uh, of product came back into the U.S. last year. So we make products in China, in India, for people in China and in India. So um, while about three and a half billion uh, cubic meters of wood is harvested on the globe each year, that's still less than, uh, than two-thirds of a percent of the base. So the world's forests are, are abundant. Uh, and while we recognize that uh, there's some illegal logging and, and unsustainable forest practices in place, it's with partners uh, like WWF and the Nature Conservancy and others uh, that we can get out there and advocate for free and fair trade and through elements like the Lacey Act, um, get after uh, where harvesting is not legally done. So um, now, as I said, as a leader of all the things that we purchase around the globe, we're taking the practices that are longstanding in international paper and starting to work those back through as we study uh, opportunities to improve the, uh, the reliability and sustainability of our entire supply chain. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, that's Linda Walker, um, the Director for Global Forest and Trade Network, North America, World Wildlife Fund. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you, Dave, for your comments. Um, I just want to start off with saying that um, we at WWF believe that the only way that we can achieve our mission and our forest conservation goals around the world is to work in collaboration with companies, with governments, with other NGOs on promoting responsible forest management and responsible forest products. So I feel fortunate to be here today uh, to share a little bit with you about WWF, what we do see as some of the threats to global forests, and what we see as some of the solutions, which include the types of conversations and innovations that we're hearing about today. Um, WWF's mission is to conserve nature and reduce some of the most pressing threats to the diversity of life on Earth. We are pragmatic, solutions-based, uh, science-based science and science-oriented, so we believe in the power of collaboration among NGOs companies, governments, and consumers in making that vision happen. Forests are critically important to our wildlife conservation efforts. Forests are home to 80% of the world's biological diversity, and all of our efforts to conserve wildlife would be for naught if we didn't have forests. But we all obviously depend on forests. We depend on forests because they filter the air we breathe, they filter the water we drink, they prevent soil erosion, and they can help mitigate climate change. And as we've heard about a lot today, forests here in the U.S. are in pretty good shape. There's more forests now than there were 100 years ago in the U.S. But around the world, forests are, in some places, under serious threat. Especially as we look out into the future, to 2050, when we might have 9 billion people on the planet all competing for food, fuel, and fiber, putting more pressure on forests, it's really important to identify where those deforestation areas are and work to mitigate those. We still lose approximately 46 football fields a minute around the world to deforestation and forest conversion. Now, a lot of that is due to agricultural conversion by cattle-related, cattle oil palm, uh, soy, but there are instances of deforestation and illegal logging, especially in the tropics, that we're very concerned about. Some of that relates to sectors that you're involved with. Um, for example, uh, problems in Indonesia with some of the illegal logging that's happened over the years related to the pulp and paper sector there. So um, the good news is that there are lots of solutions to the challenges that we see around the world. Um, and one of the one of the ways that we think, one of the best solutions is to promote responsible forestry. Uh, we brought copies of our Living Forest Report that WWF has produced over the last couple years. And again, looking out at 2050 and what are some of the threats to forests and ways that those uh, threats can be mitigated. And responsible forestry, that's forestry that's operating to the highest environmental and social standards 
and safeguarding the um, ecosystem services, and people, and wildlife that those forests protect are a key part of that solution. Another part of the solution, as I mentioned before, is partnerships. Um, I'm, I manage the Global Forest and Trade Network program in North America. That's WWF's initiative to partner with almost 200 companies around the world that are committed to the responsible production and sourcing of wood and paper products. We're proud to have a collaboration with International Paper. And through that collaboration, we're working with IP on implementing its robust commitments around fiber sourcing and certification. We also have collaborations with Kimberly Clark, Procter & Gamble, Williams Sonoma, and several other companies that are sourcing, um, that are implementing responsible sourcing commitments. So in places like Indonesia, Russia, Latin America, we're working with forest managers on uh, toward FSC certification and more responsible production. And here in the U.S., we're working with retailers, end users, and manufacturers to really drive demand for those responsible products. And finally, um, another big part of the solution from our perspective is the role that governments can play to promote responsible forestry and reduce illegal logging. It's been mentioned already today that there's a need for a level playing field for companies that are operating responsibly and a need to really call out the companies that are practicing illegal logging and make sure that those imports aren't reaching our shores. So the U.S. has led the charge in that by passing the 2008 amendments to the Lacey Act. And that has quickly been followed by similar legislation in Europe, Australia, and uh, even some legislation in China is being considered to, uh, to address illegal logging and create, create laws on the books that, that, um, that penalize illegal logging. We're also uh, very positive about the U.S.'s involvement in trade agreements like the Peru Free Trade Agreement and TPP that call out illegal logging as a key element that needs to be addressed in global trade. So finally, I just want to say that um, from WWF's perspective, we believe it's within our means to address the challenges of deforestation, recognizing and celebrating the powerful uh, successes in North America and the commitment that the industry's made here, and also address some of the real problems around the world by incentivizing responsible forest management so, our far so forests are worth more standing than to be converted to other uses by supporting responsible plantation establishment and management to get more fiber out of less land in a responsible way, by optimizing production practices to reduce waste, and by uh, doing what we can to promote recovery, increase recovery. So governments, companies, NGOs, consumers are all part of the solution, and I'm uh, really happy to be here and appreciate the opportunity to talk and learn more from you. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Donna Harmon, President and CEO, American Forest and Paper Association. Thank you. Well, I'm delighted to be here with uh, so many friends and such a distinguished panel. Uh, the American Forest and Paper Association uh, chose today and this week, this event, uh, to launch our uh, 2014 sustainability report, which looks like this. And since I work for the paper industry, I brought copies and they're on your table. Uh, we'd love for you all to take a look at it. This is an initiative that uh, our industry uh, began a few years ago. It's a comprehensive, comprehensive set of uh, quantifiable goals for the paper and wood products manufacturing sector. AFMPA represents the manufacturers of paper and wood products. So uh, if you think about just about anything that can be made from a tree, whether it's paper, paper-based packaging, uh, wood for, uh, home, for uh, home construction, energy, all of those things are, are uh, products that are made by our member companies and in their facilities. Um, our, our commitment to sustainability uh, is not just an association commitment, but it's a commitment by all of our member companies. Uh, the companies have come together and said that each of them individually, like international paper, uh, can and will do uh, certain things within their supply chain. But as an industry, we're committed to ensuring a sustainable supply chain. And, uh, that's, and as the purchasers of large amounts of wood to manufacture those products, we have a fair amount of leverage. And I think that that's where some of the um, uh, uh, public or the private sector and uh, NGO partnerships that we've been able to uh, 
uh, create and work with throughout uh, the, all of our companies have been really successful in helping to do that. Uh, some of the key points and key elements that the industry uh, identified uh, in establishing our sustainability goals uh, were uh, really informed by our collaboration and our work with uh, some of our NGO partners. Uh, we've worked for years and years and years on, uh, on paper recovery for recycling and uh, actually are at about, um, have achieved a 63% recovery rate. That's something that I know that all congressional offices, all congressional staff uh, are doing every day in your, in your work here is making certain uh, that you have a robust recycling program. And I know the House of Representatives in particular has done uh, quite a lot over the years to help improve that program. That's a perfect example of, uh, of a partnership um, where education is uh, so critically important to, in order to know what, it, what should be recycled, where it should be recycled, how it can be recycled, and then knowing that it goes throughout that supply chain. So um, greenhouse gas uh, reductions are another of our goals. You can see the chart there. Uh, we're very, very close to achieving that goal of reducing our greenhouse gas uh, emissions. Uh, as well as uh, uh, water is another uh, critically important issue in the pulp and paper sector in particular, making certain that we have a, a wise use uh, and, and are uh, working to reduce our, uh, our use of water. But much of our water, which you might be surprised to know, is uh, most of the water that we use, we actually return back to the environment cleaner than what it came into our facilities. Biomass has been mentioned many times, and I know that that's something that we'll have more conversation uh, about uh, the energy's use of biomass. Uh, as International Paper um, uh, had the statistic of 70% in their facilities, industry-wide, uh, it's about 63% uh, of all of the energy we use is from biomass. Uh, but in addition to that, we use that biomass through cogeneration, which is you know one, one of the most uh, efficient ways of producing that energy, and I know there's a great uh, Display. We have some uh, uh, some folks here from the Department of Energy and some others who are experts on uh, the cogeneration uh, that's used in the industry. So safety is another important element uh, for our industry. When we think about sustainability, we think about it from an economic perspective. We think about it from an environmental perspective and from a social perspective, because the nearly 900,000 jobs that are in this industry and in this supply chain are critically important to a number of, uh, well, to all of, all of you and all of your congressional districts. Um, our industry is among the top 10 manufacturing industries in 47 states. So it's a, quite a large footprint, and the economic contributions uh, to U.S. communities uh, is, is really critical, as well as our place in the global marketplace. Um, we've had some mention of uh, illegal logging, and happy to talk about that more in the context of uh, the Q&A. Thank you very much. And now to uh, Bill Millen, who's a senior policy advisor for TNC, and he has been the senior policy advisor for TNC ever since the Forest Organic Act was written, I reckon. But anyway, always to you, Bill. Thank you, Kosh. Sometimes I feel like I've been doing this since they planted the first tree. Um, um, I'm going to take a slightly different tack from where most people have done because my personal background is in international politics, economics, and history. I was a diplomat for 20 years before coming to TNC, and my duties at TNC are pretty much exclusively international. So I thought it might be interesting to put some of the issues we've been discussing in a larger context of what's going on in the world, as it were and to do it in five minutes. Um, for starters, it's been obvious for a long time that the structure of independent nation states, which has been the building block of international affairs since at least the Treaty of Westphalia in the 1640s, is visibly declining. The instinctive loyalty and deference that ordinary people give to their nat native states is declining. And uh, the world instead is becoming more influenced by what are called non-state actors, many of which are anarchic and all too often violent. The nation state has committed many sins in the last 300 and some odd years, but we'll miss it if it goes. At this moment when, uh, to, to quote the poet Yeats, it sometimes appears that mere anarchy is loosed upon the world and the center cannot hold, at this moment, 
the world is facing tremendous economic, social, and cultural tensions caused by the disequilibrium between the rich world and the rest. If you look around you, you among your friends and associates and colleagues in this room, remind yourself that only about 5% of the world lives like the people in this room. Another 10 or 15% live pretty decently and all the rest are poor. The world now has 7 billion people. By 2050, it will have at least 9 billion, more, very likely 10, and 100% of the increase will take place in the tropics. It's in the tropics that uh, th 3 billion people currently live on $5 a day or less, where a billion people have no access to electricity, uh, and where the population is still growing much more rapidly than in the north. Now, what does this mean for forestry? Well, globally, there really is no issue of deforestation in the temperate zone or the boreal forest. There are issues, there are problems, but deforestation on a net basis is not the problem in those regions. In the tropics, deforestation is still an issue, uh, and a major one. And uh, as we go forward into this era of, of, of tensions and disequilibrium and, and uh, uh, conflict, political and otherwise, internationally, the pressure on remaining natural areas in the tropics is going to be enormous from growing populations who not only uh, want to go on living in some sort of a decent way, but who want to live in a way somewhat more similar to the way we live, about which they now know very well. They know how the rest of the world lives. To simply say, this is a beautiful forest, put a fence around it, is not an answer. Um, if you go back 20 years ago, most of us conservation groups, we focused on parks and protected areas. And that's valid, and we still do it to a certain extent. But biodiversity is typically a function of habitat. The more habitat you have, ultimately the more species you have. If you protect the 10% of the world's area that's in protected areas, and let the rest be trashed, in the end you'll be left with 10% of the species. So we need to work on a larger scale, and the Nature Conservancy now for 10 or 15 years increasingly does that. We work in what we call the landscape scale. We work in cooperation with private businesses, with local governments, with national governments. What this means for forestry is things like the Barao Project, uh, where uh, we're working with tens of thousands of villagers in a district in Indonesia that has 6 million acres of pristine forest and 300,000 people. In uh, helping the villagers to assert their interests, their desires for the future, their right to their forest, and doing it in ways where we think that the, the carbon footprint will go down, the areas being converted to oil prom will go down, um, and yet the people will be able to develop in a variety of ways. The future that we envision for areas like that is one in which the most significant and sensitive areas are indeed permanently protected as parks or protected areas. But there are also working production forests and, uh, and other areas where people can make a living. The key thing for international forestry in the topics begins with legality, cracking down on illegal logging. And for that, things like Lacey are tremendously important. But beyond Lacey it, uh, and beyond legality, it goes to sustainability. And this is where the best of the U.S. companies and the alliances of U.S. companies are showing leadership to the world. And we work in close cooperation with many of these companies. And at, uh, in, with our, the so-called RAF program in Asia, for example, we have, uh, we're working with 81 uh, logging and forest products companies over millions of acres. Two million acres have already moved into FSC certification. Companies are using logging methods that are less destructive to the forest. They're encouraged to replant. This is the way forward for many of those areas. If I had more time, I could use it, but the same would be true of all my colleagues. So I'll stop now and would welcome any questions. Thank you, Bill. Uh, thanks in particular for taking that wide scope and doing it in five minutes. Um, I'll open up for Q&A, we don't have that much time, but we'll take a few, and then if not, I'll pitch in. So anybody, any questions for our panelists? Okay, well, while you're thinking about it, a um, couple of thoughts that was mentioned, I think I'll pick the conservation side just to put the context and then go and ask some comments. One is, both from WWF and TNC, I think it's important to note that deforestation, at least in the temperate zone, 
net sort of loss of forest cover and temperate zone is no longer the primary environmental concern. I think it's really important. However, it is so in the tropical zone, but that also need to be put in conversion, I mean in context, which is that when we lose forest in the tropics, most of the time, not it, overwhelming is conversion to other land uses like agriculture, ranching, or others. It's not clear-cutting as was thought to be the case a few decades ago. So I think the conversation here is more on forestry and forest practices, and in so doing, I think it's important to keep that context in place. The other important context to put in place is that the U.S. forest industry here there are, I think, few sectors in U.S. government, especially on the land use side of stuff, which is more regulated and held to a more higher ethical standards. I think it's good to important to keep that, and especially people who are here in the Agriculture Committee, without going too much in detail, the forest practice and state forest practices law in Oregon and California and other places would require a lot more than other land uses of similar kind in that state. And that turns into the forest industry in the United States, just because the laws and the tension we talked about has really a higher performance, responsible forestry record than you'll find in other parts of the world, in other industry. So I think these are important contexts to keep in place when we get into the conversation of responsible forestry. And that's another important point mentioned. We've gone, I think, a step beyond sustainability. Sustainable forestry was done and practiced ever since we learned forestry from here, from German immigrants that came to country, started Yale Cornell Forestry School. We got the Forest Service. We've been doing sustainable linear programming forestry, where we cut the timber and cut. We're talking now about responsible forestry, which is a step with sustainable plus on ethical, economic, and social issues. And then the manufacturing, the job creation in part and a collective loop on the renewable energy. I think there are important things to keep in mind when we are discussing this issue, at least in this country, and as we go forward. So I think any of those four or five points, and I, I want to ask uh, Dave in particular, I'd like you to see if there are examples that have worked in US, especially in Southern, and how you are trying to take them overseas. You talked a little bit about India and China and forestries, because I think, again, how we're doing a great job in America, how we can move forward, and what are some of the things we're taking overseas through IP and as it's working. Yes, thank you, Kush. Um, we have developed, uh, you know, over the course of decades, great forest practices uh, that we used across our base in the south. Um, and now, with the changing ownership models, uh, we remain engaged in that. But we have a, a wealth of experience in forestry, everything from the seedling to the harvest. And today, uh, within the company, I have a, a global forestry council that has representatives from every area that we operate in across the globe with the, with the explicit intent of sharing best practices, uh, from conservation. In fact, one of the members is in the back of the room. Uh, Sophie's on, Sophie Beckham is, is on that, um, you know, representing the, uh, the sustainability side. But each one of my foresters, that's part of their DNA. But we, we share that expertise, um, whether we're operating in Russia, we're working on plantations, which will be more efficient use uh, of land in, in Poland. We have farm forestry programs that are being enhanced uh, by the presence of international paper in India um, with our colleagues in Brazil who have a, a rich history of plantation forestry, which is very efficient and very well managed around our facilities in Brazil. We can share those across the southern hemisphere as well. So we have made a very explicit effort to, uh, to continue to, uh, to enrich that experience. When we go into a place like India, which we did uh, just under three years ago, it gives us an opportunity to, to bring the ethic that we have, and probably as much as anything else, I think that's an important aspect. 
Thank you very much. And if I may ask uh, Ms. Walker, I, you mentioned a, little, a lot engagement and also your responsibilities on the forest trade side. So what are some of the things that are happening there? Um, what can we do more about it and how it links directly to both the manufacturing, processing, and the conservation side of things? Thank you. Uh, well, I think that, as we all know, the trade in forest products is um, is very much a global trade now. And uh, we have beautiful red oak logs being shipped from the US over to China and made into flooring and then shipped back over here to the US. So we have some very interesting trade flow patterns that have changed a lot in the past 10 years. But I think that presents a tremendous opportunity, both for some um, hardwood and uh, uh, industry uh, industries in the US that are seeking markets both here in the U.S. and overseas, and it presents an opportunity for U.S. companies operating both here and overseas to, uh, to broaden their supply, to, uh, to expand their own operations in other places through joint ventures and other, uh, other business opportunities. And the good news from our perspective, our organization's perspective, is that when companies like IP or, or US companies that have a very strong public commitment to responsibility um, do start operating in overseas markets, that can really um, incentivize some companies in those other markets to look at their own practices, to look at the competition that's coming in, and to you know, rise the level of their own practices. I think that our organization tries to shine a spotlight on companies operating overseas that are doing better practices and to demonstrate the business value of those commitments, both to those companies and the business value of companies that might be importing those products here in North America um, from a brand risk, from a legal risk, and from a, from a uh, consumer marketing risk standpoint. So I think that there's a lot of positive market links that we're trying to make between an increasing number of companies that recognize the business value of responsible production and sourcing. Thank you very much. I know, Ms. Harmon, you wanted to talk about a little bit about biomass energy and carbon neutrality, like a growing field in the forestry. So carbon neutrality is actually one of those interesting issues that's both a domestic issue as well as an international issue. If you look around the globe and you look at what uh, Europe is doing, uh, Europe fully recognizes the carbon neutrality of biomass. In fact, biomass energy is playing a great role in their ability to meet their climate, uh, climate commitments and greenhouse gas reduction uh, uh, targets. Um, in the United States, it's also a domestic issue. It's an issue that the Environmental Protection Agency is currently considering, uh, and we're anticipating that they'll put out a framework for how to account for biogenic carbon at some point here, and then hopefully in the next few weeks. That could go uh, either way. Our earlier panel this morning of the members of Congress uh, you know, noted uh, appropriately so that for the first time the U.S. has basically um, uh, made a determination to treat biomass energy in the same manner as fossil fuel energy. And as you can see, that makes a really huge difference uh, for this industry, given that so much of our energy comes from biomass and biomass is renewable. People are often confused about, well, what is this concept of carbon neutrality? All it means is what we've been talking about here today. If you're planting, growing uh, more trees than what you're harvesting, then the energy from the, that is made from the biomass from those trees should be considered carbon neutral. And that was in the foundation of the UN IPCC report um, at really, you know, 20 years or so ago. So here in the United States, we're kind of on the cusp. I think it's an issue that's really important for the Congress to be paying attention to because the implications for how EPA decides to ultimately uh, treat biomass energy uh, in the framework that they're going to put out uh, will have a huge impact around the globe and on the domestic industry and uh, how we how we look uh, and how our products look um, as uh, as consumers and others are interested in making sure that in fact uh, you know that we're doing the responsible thing we're um, quite uh, uh, 
sure that there's a that there the, that there's a path forward. There's a solution forward here of uh, working together with the Congress and with the EPA to get an answer that both protects the environment but also recognizes the the carbon cycle uh, and just the fact that trees are the the lungs of the earth um, and that as long as we're planting and growing. Uh, more trees in the future, and we're operating in a sustainable manner that our biomass energy will be making a positive contribution to our greenhouse gas reduction. Thank you very much. I mean, it's a classic case of one side does not fit all. And in this given instances, I think there are substantive and significant differences uh, that may call for a further review. But Bill, I might ask you a question now. You mentioned another great example after the so the world tour about Indonesia and how communities worked. And TNC, I think, is a unique organization that has a strong and large conservation imprint in America, here in the United States, and an increasing imprint overseas. And it's known for working with communities, empowering, and its own properties also takes an approach of uh, responsible use. So what are some of the lessons that we can learn from getting communities engaged overseas and at the same time what has worked here so that we try to find these constructive answers uh, and give them a better play? Sure. Well, the way it started out here was with a committee of professional conservation scientists who got together and said, we're tired of just studying na with nature. We want to protect some of it. And so they did a fundraiser and they bought a, a gorge in Connecticut uh, that was bird habitat. So that was the beginning of it. Now in terms of our working with communities and so forth, as the organization got bigger, we started organizing state chapters. And in the state chapters, we had participation by distinguished local citizens, um, uh, what we call trustees. And uh, we found that um, because of the local ties that we had built, because of the trust with which we were regarded, because we worked cooperatively and non-confrontationally, we signed up a lot of ranchers, we signed up a lot of farmers, we signed up a lot of forest uh, owners uh, as members of the organization and activists for the organization. So that's how it has worked in the United States. Internationally, um, it, it's, it's very much a case of, as you put it, one side does not necessarily fit all because it depends on the state of governance in the country. Uh, to what extent there is a respect for a rule of law. It depends on the, the type of rural land uh, tenure that is held, whether it is some form of customary tenure held by families or clans or communities, whether uh, all the rural land in theory belongs to the state, which is the case in Indonesia, or whether you have a large number of private landowners and are they giant estates like the so-called latifundias of Latin America or there, are they relatively small holdings? And depending on, on how that mixture works out, it is sometimes possible to create uh, or foster the creation of uh, non-governmental organizations like we have here in the United States. And there are a bunch of them now in Latin America who are dedicated to conservation and who become, in, in effect, activists and lobbyists for conservation in their domestic scene, be in Costa Rica or Colombia or, uh, or Brazil. Um, in other countries which don't have that tradition, the model that works is for local scientists to team up with uh, foreign NGOs like ourselves or our friends at WWF with whom we are very often working in alliance. Um, and the partners on the other side very often are entities of government. And it could be national government or it could be local. I mean, a big difference in Indonesia has been uh, the, the, the tremendous devolution of power to localities which took place about 10 years ago after the fall of Suharto. So I guess the short answer is that it depends. It's always a good answer in environment and conservation, <laughs> yes. Um, you know, I think economics was often called the dismal science because of Malthus and Ricard and all those guys. And sometimes we feel in today's day and age that if you're an ecologist, I happen to be a little bit of both, so that we have kind of replaced the economist by saying there's a gloom and doom out in the world. But forestry, and we need to sort of take examples and really celebrate conservation success stories when we find them. And forestry in this country and a good part of the globe, forest conservation really is a good co 
conservation, successful conservation story. For the partnership you heard from WWF to TNC, from IPP, American Forest Products, there is a great success story on how forest conservation truly has moved and moved forward in a good and very effective way. Uh, moving away from sustainable to even higher standard of responsibility. And I think it ought to be celebrated. And here's where the tension comes in, the constructive tension that we talked about in the previous session, that they ought to be used in coming up and changing the conversation from not cutting, not using, to how to do it. And I think that's what I think the congressman uh, from Oregon is trying to say, that we can move beyond the timber wars. So let's go, f because you really can do any good effective conservation either in Indonesia or a place that WWF is, and you're in the trade business, if you're not in the conversation of saying how can we sustainably and responsibly use this product. And for us, a nation that lives in houses built by wood, I think it ought to be humble and honest to say and talk about this every time you're in and out of a building or a house. Uh, so I think that's the conversation, and in so doing, also the the conversation is the right one, how to use it, and it's become more diverse from not just how do I grow trees, cut trees, and maintain wildlife, now it's growing trees, cutting trees, and looking at carbon neutrality, and looking at biomass energy, and looking at the amount of sort of value chains up north, south, and east, west, as Congressman Owens talked about in New York. So it, as looking at an industry that historically in the country has provided enormous amount of jobs, has been the biggest job drivers in part of the West, and even today has almost a 900,000 and more in this sector. So it's a, it's a rich area, a positive area, and it'd be good as we go forward so that we can move to the how question, which is far more pragmatic, as, as you mentioned, than perhaps uh, ideological and destructive as we go forward. So with that note, um, I think time is up. Um, we may give a great round of applause to our great panel and then off to the next call of the deep.